This week, cars, bars, and a police ride. On my way to a reported incident on one of Las Vegas' busiest highways. On your channel, 76 to the accident on Rainbow 95. With the last rain falling over four months ago, the oily roads mixed with the fresh water have become a lethal recipe for disaster. In the driving seat is Sergeant John Arias from Nevada Highway Patrol. He's using WayCare, software that alerts him to an incident as soon as it's reported via someone calling 911 or through driving apps like Waze. And it provides him with details and the best route to get to the scene. So tell me the locations, what kind of accident, if it's uh, debris, uh, how long it's going, and if there's any responders that are already signed to the call that are on their way. It constantly updates him on the situation as it develops. Having a robust system in place doesn't just help with weather-related collisions. The uh, Route 91 shooting that we had at uh, uh, Mandalay, for the portion that we handled in the highway patrol is really getting the public that's on the strip off the highway as quickly as possible or closing off the freeway so we can have those critical resources, fire, medical, ambulances, uh, to get people to the hospital and get there quickly. In 2017, 15,000 crashes were tended to, with over 300 people dying on average each year in road accidents in Nevada. Getting emergency services to the scene as quickly as possible is critical. We're going to send injury to it, and it's camera 217. The system has been running through the Regional Transportation Commission's Traffic Management Center for the past three months. Now, because we're getting information in through so many different data streams, not just the dispatchers, but we're getting it through social media, we're getting it through things like the Waze app, so as people are tagging them in as they're driving, because all of this is happening so quickly, we might have already sent out all of that information and had everybody in this room aware before the first 911 call comes in. So we're talking about possibly 10 to 15 minutes of improvement in response time for some of these incidents. That's major when you're dealing with traffic incidents. Waycare pulls in data from several sources, traffic signals, CCTV cameras, in-vehicle sensors, and information from driving apps. It factors in things like what day of the year it is, the time of day, and the weather. Responding to incidents rapidly is one thing, but the point is to be able to predict incidents before they happen, so the responders can be better prepared and in the right location. Using deep learning, what we do is we look at the historical data, run it through algorithms to uh, develop a patterns that are emerging and tie it to what's happening now on the road. And by doing that, we're essentially able to look forward in time to identify where these incidents are likely to occur. Unfortunately, Waycare wasn't able to predict this one. See the troopers taking pictures, it looks like it's the rear. Yeah. You see how she was spinning out? She did a full uh, 180 and struck right here. Being able to foresee accidents here could really save lives. The hope is that as the data gets more sophisticated, the predictions will become more accurate. Every day we get more and more evidence about what causes, what triggers an incident, and the artificial learning gets smarter and smarter and more capable. For Nevada now though, the initial results are promising. They get there faster, we clear it faster, and that means less secondary accidents. And if you think about it, secondary accidents have basically have 18% of secondary accidents are fatalities. So we're reducing the fatalities on the roadway. And of course, the goal is to prevent accidents altogether. And Richard Taylor and Lara Lewington have been looking at some in-car technologies that may help make that a reality. At CES, as you might expect, there's a lot of interest in self-driving cars. And it's pretty clear that we're on a one-way street towards full autonomy. 
but that does still seem to be a way off, although we don't know exactly how far. In the meantime, though, there is plenty of innovation to be seen before we reach our final destination. Unsurprisingly, the move towards automated driving is focused largely on safety, with Hyundai creating a system to intervene when we need it the most. The car's fitted with a combination of biometric sensors in the seat, they're tracking heart rate, and a low-resolution camera which is tracking your facial movements. Now, the reason it's low resolution is so that the refresh rate is a lot quicker. So if there's a problem, if it seems that you've lost concentration or you're drifting off to sleep, then the car can quickly react to autonomously be moved off the road to a safe spot. And the basic premise of this technology could be available in just a year. Meanwhile, Nissan has a different, even more futuristic twist on biometrics using my grey matter. The idea of this system is really to provide an interaction between man and machine, between my brain and the AI. And the concept here with Nissan is that even in a world of autonomous vehicles, there will be roles for humans to play. After all, a lot of people do find driving quite a positive experience. It can interpret the signals coming from the human and actually enhance the ride. This so-called brain-to-vehicle tech currently involves wearing this bizarre-looking electrode-studded helmet to capture my brain activity and interpret the signals as much as half a second before my muscles do. So, as I'm about to say change lane or hit the brakes, it will initiate the action for me, giving me a smoother ride and yet still allowing me a sense of control. I do need to sort out that helmet though. <laughs> oh dear, I'm not driving very well here. Yet what we can't hide away from is the fact that when full autonomy does come to pass, it's not simply about cars. This is Yamaha's concept motorbike, a self-driving racing vehicle that should be able to do speeds of over 120 miles per hour, although not on actual roads, you'd hope. But whatever the form of autonomous vehicle, it'll need to interact safely with pedestrians and cyclists too, a challenge that Ford are hoping to overcome in their vehicles. Initially, cyclists will have to be seen by the vehicles, and we are building perception into our autonomous vehicle that allows the autonomous vehicle to detect the cyclist objects, to understand their intent, to ensure that we can be safely navigating in the same space. And Ford are just one of the big brands who've called upon the help of NVIDIA, whose processors combined with intelligent software can make the environment around the vehicle safer. For example, using LiDAR sensors to alert a driver who's about to open a car door onto a cyclist. And AI is fueling other experiences inside the car too. Speech recognition specialists' nuance power many of today's in-car interactions, and they showed off how they'll look in future as well. Today we think about the assistant as something that we interact with using voice, but we can add other modalities. Of course we have the screen, we have touch, but maybe we can use gestures. And in this specific prototype we introduced eye tracking as, as a way of helping the assistant understand what am I as a driver looking at, and then I can ask questions about my environment. So if I see a coffee shop in front of me, I can just ask a question about it. What is the user rating of this coffee shop? Starbucks coffee has a user rating of three stars. So the other part of the system is that there are microphones placed in different parts of the car, which means that the AI can respond according to where the different passengers are. So here in the passenger seat, I can say, hello, dragon, I'm cold. OK, raising the temperature in zone 2 to 71.0 degrees. There's definitely a trend towards making our journeys more enjoyable as well as safer. Toyota have even updated their happiness tracking concept car, aiming for a more pleasurable journey and even suggesting where you might want to go for anyone who needs their car to tell them. Since you are a foodie, I'll tell you something interesting. There are many options around Union Square, from casual dining to Michelin starred, high-end restaurants as well as popular cafes. Do you like it? Yes. Sounds good. Well, that was a bit of fun, but I didn't need the AI to tell me that I was ready for dinner. Sushi? Yeah, let's go. Let's go.
Welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that Ford announced it will invest £8 billion in electric cars in the next five years. A flaw in a VR porn app called SynVR left 20,000 users' names and email addresses exposed. And hackers managed to steal $400,000 worth of cryptocurrency by hijacking a server that hosts a web-based wallet for virtual currency. It was a busy week for cryptocurrency as Bitcoin encountered its biggest daily crash in four months. It's thought that fears over increased regulation, particularly in Asia, were behind the downturn. A contraceptive app previously heralded as being as effective as the pill has been criticised by a Swedish hospital for a number of unintended pregnancies they say were linked to the app. The company behind the app Natural Cycles have defended the product, saying that as with any form of contraception, it's not 100% effective. They are now launching an internal investigation, however. And I bet you didn't expect the latest Nintendo offering to include, well, a whole load of cardboard. The latest add-ons for the Switch console are cardboard for packs, turning the controllers into a fishing rod, a motorbike, and even a robot suit. Gimmick or brilliant? And finally, a rescue with a difference, as a drone was used to save two swimmers in trouble off the coast of New South Wales in Australia. Lifeguards were being trained to use the rescue drone when practice suddenly became reality, and the drone was launched, dropping a flotation device to the teenagers. The whole rescue took just 70 seconds. In this trendy part of downtown Las Vegas, these passengers are waiting to hop on a special kind of ride. For the past two months, French autonomous vehicle company Navia has been offering free bus rides to the public. Admittedly, it doesn't travel far, it just does a loop around the block with one stop at a donut shop. Hmm, well, at least they're getting a taste of the future. Down the road, though, I'm waiting to catch a more private ride, which I've booked on an app. Uh, as if by magic, the door opened. <laughs> the team was still ironing out a few issues, shall we say. I think this is the first genuinely autonomous vehicle I've been in where there, there really is no driver and there really is no, no place for a driver. There's just safety man here. <laughs> and that's it. Safety man has an Xbox One controller down by his side. Navia is certainly not alone in this space. Uber and Google's Waymo have been battling it out for some time to become the first fully autonomous cab sharing service. Self-driving cars use a lot of sensors to be able to navigate the roads safely. Perhaps one of the most important is LiDAR. This is what enables the car to judge its surroundings. And the design of these sensors is at the heart of Waymo and Uber's court case. Navia's car is no different. It too uses LiDAR to look around. Interestingly, what it's not doing is looking at the traffic lights to judge what colour they are. They've actually fitted special sensors to each traffic light and those sensors talk to the car. So that doesn't sound very scalable to me. That sounds like you wouldn't be able to put this kind of technology on the open road without fitting every single traffic light in the US with these sensors. This is much more just for predetermined routes for, um, for these kind of shuttle vehicles. Now, while I've been riding around in this particular smart vehicle, Dave Lee has been up in Reno, not that far away, looking at a system that's making use of data collected by vehicles like this to help an entire city to move more smoothly. There's been great strides made in self-driving technology over the past decade or so, but the thing about autonomy is that it's often tested in bright, clear conditions. The real world is much more distracting. In fact, it's not just darkness that's difficult for existing autonomous technologies. Whether it's through rain, snow, or just far up ahead on the road, there's a lot self-driving vehicles struggle to see. Important work is taking place at the University of Reno, Nevada, that's attempting to solve that problem, making autonomy more intelligent. And it all begins here, on the corner of 50 and Virginia. 
So at that corner, we have the LiDAR sensor. That LiDAR sensor used to be on the autonomous vehicle, but we move it from the vehicle to the intersection, so it can track each pedestrian here, each vehicle here. What kind of things is it picking up? Is it recognizing who people are or, or not? Uh, no, it, it only recognizes this is a pedestrian or this is a vehicle. It does not recognize uh, who the person is. Think of this intersection as providing more eyes to an autonomous vehicle. It could detect a threat and communicate that to a car heading in its direction, telling it to slow down and beware. So what these sensors are doing, in essence, is giving autonomous cars more eyes along the road. Yes. So they just know more about what's coming up ahead of them. Exactly. So no black spot. Part of the same program is this connected car, a modified Lincoln that can not only drive itself around, but also communicate with other vehicles and components in the city, signaling its intentions to others. The, the hardware that you see is pretty similar to what you're going to see in, in most autonomous vehicles, if not all of them. Uh, where we really uh, distinguish ourselves is in the software. Uh, so our research focus is on what I call social intelligence. We are trying to build machines that understand people, and understand human social behavior and can predict what other people are going to do and then act appropriately. It's a skill that humans have. Uh, you know, we navigate driving effortlessly even though we can't read other people's minds. Um, and it's a skill that computers are going to have to have if they're ever going to drive cars in the world with the rest of us. And then there's that challenge of making the technology work in difficult conditions. Inspired by an earlier project to help drones see in the dark, the team at the university's autonomous robots lab has combined LiDAR, radar and cameras that use advanced image recognition. Not only does this dramatically improve what the car can comprehend, it's also pretty cheap. Once that technology is safe and ready, the plan is to deploy it on electric buses like this one. But until then, the team plans to use the autonomous tech to gather large amounts of data in preparation for a self-driving future. This bus, made by California-based Proterra, is already out on Reno's roads, but right now with a more traditional type of driver. It's not autonomous yet. Um, the idea is to, at some point, focus on that project. However, right now we're focusing on data collection for what we call the Living Lab and data collection that is going to be used for uh, the Intelligent Mobility program. For the foreseeable future, these buses will gather data for the Living Lab program in Reno, a city that perhaps knows more about what's going on on its streets than almost any other city in the world. That was Dave. And now to something that we've been hearing a lot about recently, augmented reality. Now it works by overlaying graphics on top of the real world, and whilst AR games like Pokemon Go have enjoyed global success, the most hyped bit of AR kit, Magic Leap, is still waiting to be released. AR remains a technology that promises more than it delivers. But by combining AR with AI, researchers in Florida are hoping to create new ways to train people to perform complex tasks. Mark Chislak took their AR kit for a test drive, or should that be a test flight? The University of Central Florida has a long established relationship with the simulation industry, helping create simulated experiences for everything from driving to supermarket shopping. The simulation lab here's latest project is a bit more high-flying than high street, though. As long as we've had PCs, we've had flight simulators. But if you're really serious about learning how to fly, then you need an aircraft and a human pilot to teach you what to do. Well, this lab is about to be transformed into an aircraft cockpit with the help of this augmented reality headset. And when I put it on, it'll also provide me with my very own virtual captain. Called Project Cap, it's a collaboration with aerospace giants Boeing. Necessary information. Sure, I'm done with my flow and ready for your takeoff brief. Give it your best try. The AR cockpit companion is designed as an additional training aid for pilots. 
the portability of the HoloLens meaning they can brush up on skills or practice in almost any environment. It does feel as if I can reach out and touch the controls and I'm very much tempted to and I do that and of course there's nothing there. Thin air. OK Cap, you seem to have a better idea of what to do in this aircraft, so call for taxi. Roger, the sequence will be two followed by one. You are cleared to start number two. Ready. At the moment, Cap responds to a very small number of voice commands or questions. Beacon. On. Mic check. Mic check. One, two, three. But this sort of simple practice can still be useful for trainee pilots. Augmented reality gives us a chance to bridge the gap between the things that have always been trapped in the digital world and the real world around us. How can we start to merge those two things together in effective ways? How can we create holograms right before you for things that might be less safe if you were to do them in the real world, or that you might need additional information besides what you can build around you in the real world? Closed and locked. Oh, so he looks behind him to check that. V1-120, VR-140. It's a very convincing illusion that there's a pilot in here with me. Any questions? Do we have a specific altitude restriction for this SID? A year in development, Cap himself is actually modelled on a real pilot. We had an opportunity to take some of our uh, friends who are pilots, in this case one in particular, and see if he would actually subject himself to a full body scan to then be able to use him as our avatar. So that's who we have, an actual pilot who knows the mannerisms and gestures that we could put into that virtual pilot seat. But is this another instance of technology putting people out of their jobs? No, not at all. It's to provide student pilots with the opportunity to practice interpersonal skills um, before they actually get to a flight training center with real pilots. And we can provide them with a greater breadth of experiences through introducing different variables such as different culture types or personality styles that they can practice with. And I do wonder about other applications for this sort of uh, this sort of kit. Somebody that might be able to teach you how to drive a car, for instance, or teach you how to operate various bits of equipment and machinery. Some of the work that we had done before doing the work with Boeing was in things like medical simulation, being able to have a holographic overlay so that you could see the x-rays laid on top exactly placed, or the CT scans or MRIs. Those are things that we think hold great promise, not only just because they'll help with visualization, but they might actually lead to better quality of care or life-saving because you have better access to data right when you need it. So one day beyond the cockpit, CAP's digital descendants might help teach us how to do all kinds of things. Sure, no problem. And from Boeing to boozing. I'm on my way to the Tipsy Robot, a bar where mixology has been given a high-tech makeover. Here, the drinks are shaken and served by these two chaps. I can even invent my own cocktail by choosing from some of the 120-odd spirits hanging from the ceiling. Or I assume all of the 120-odd spirits that I want. Can I do that? No, I can't do that, apparently. These droids can mix over a hundred cocktails an hour between the two of them. Now that sounded impressive till I discovered that some human bartenders can do ten times that. And that is it for Click in the US for this week. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at BBC Click where you can see loads of extra backstage videos and photos. Although trust me, you don't want to see what happens after I have one or two of these. Uh, cheers. See you soon. Oh, fruity. Thank <laughs> you.